welcome to Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. Here we explore the training and development of America's leaders in the application of air power and the profession of arms. The views expressed are those of the hosts and do not reflect the official policy or position of the United States Air Force, Department of Defense, or the U.S. government. The mention of companies by name is solely for the purpose of discussion and should not be implied as endorsement. Welcome back to another episode of Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. I'm Colin Slade. And I'm Reed Gann, and we're your hosts for Commission Ed. All right, Reed. So we are recording on May 21st. So just a couple of weeks ahead of the official start of summer, right? Which is an exciting time for all of us because it means we get to go outside, enjoy outdoor activities, travel a little bit, maybe. Also, for many people, it means a PCS, a permanent change of station. They're going to move across the country. And for some of those people, that includes our commanders. And, you know, we've spent quite a bit of time this year talking about commanders, the what's and how's of command, what it means to be a commander. And through all of that, we've also tried to emphasize the contrary nature of command. One of those contraries being that infinite amount of things that commanders have to do all of the to do's on their list and the very finite amount of time that is available for them to do it. And this is being highlighted up front to us right this very moment as these commanders are looking to PCS to their next duty station, leaving command, maybe moving on to another command. But just as it is the PCS season, that means it is now also the change of command season. Yeah, exactly. And Colin, at this point, I'm trying to remember how many changes of command I've been to, been a part of. I don't think you could. There's a lot, but it's something that we haven't discussed. And a lot of change happens with this seemingly small, short, simple ceremony. There's a lot of tradition and history that goes into it. And there's kind of a lot involved and big stakes. And so we just thought it'd be a really good idea Let's just line out a little quick toolbox episode on what a change of command is and some things that we think you ought to be thinking about, whether you are participating in the change of command, leading it, or just kind of showing up to your first one. There's a lot going on here, and we think that, you know, it's a good time to talk about it. Yeah, let's be honest about it. You know, change of any sort can be difficult, right? It can be frustrating, it can be jarring. Change is hard. And that's going to be true for, everybody involved for the commanders, for their families, for the unit. But, you know, that's not something that we like to do on this podcast is just point out a hard problem and do nothing about it. Right. And so to your point, yeah, let's talk about some different tips and tricks, put together a little toolbox for those of us like you and me who are going to be part of the change of command, but not the commander. Right. Yeah. All with the goal to make the transition for the commander and for us suck a little bit less, right? So in order to do that, let's first talk about what a change of command is. So in its most classic form, in the simplest that you'll ever see it, it's a brief ceremony presided over by a senior officer. That person is usually going to be the boss of the outgoing and the future commander. So if this is a squadron command, a squadron change of command, that will likely be a group commander. Same thing if a wing commander is changing out, it's probably going to be a general officer of some sort that will preside over that change of command. Yeah, that's a good point to highlight here real quick. This may be the first time you interact with a general officer, depending on where you are, your experience. The change of command very, very often will involve, you know, three, four star generals. My wing commander is getting replaced this year, and our change of command is presided over by a three star. Mm -hmm. So if this is the first time you've ever interacted with a general, maybe you should think about this event a little bit before you just kind of show up. So that's kind of why we want to break it down today. Yeah. And the providing officer is going to have a lot to say about how the ceremony itself is going to play out whether it'll be done indoors, outdoors, will there be a formation or something along those lines? And also the number of stars that are involved 
should tell you something about the gravitas of the moment, right? That's not to say that the change of command for a wing commander is any more or less important than that of a squadron commander or vice versa. But the further up the echelons these ceremonies occur, expect that there's going to be quite a bit more pomp and circumstance, more protocol, and a greater expectation for how you are involved in that ceremony. Yeah. Some a way that we talk about this sometimes is like the more stars you have, the bigger your tail gets. So make sure, <laughs> you know, so if you think about it, right, like imagine a dinosaur walking around an office building, the bigger yeah. the dinosaur, the tail that sticks behind that thing is going to be bigger and knock more things over. And that's, yeah. yeah, that's a good point. One thing I would like to point out sometimes for a squadron commander, this could be their very first time receiving command. Mm -hmm. And so for them personally, even though it's maybe, like you said, a little bit less pomp, a little bit less in that way, for them personally, it may be more meaningful. Whereas for a wing commander, they've likely commanded maybe two times prior to that, maybe even more. Right. But yeah, kind of an interesting thing. Still a lot going on. Good thing, Colin. There's an instruction that helps us know where to turn right. for all this. And, and we'll talk about this kind of in our tips and tricks at the end. But you may be asked to lead one of these events. So it's good to know that you can turn to AFPAM 341202 for kind of the rundown. What does an AFPAM read? Oh, it's an Air Force pamphlet. So not all things are instructions. Sometimes we've got you know, handbooks and manuals. In this circumstance, we've got a pamphlet. Yeah, that's interesting. And I think what that does is it shows you that if you are involved in this ceremony in some way and you're trying to find guidance, it's not showing up in an AFI. Well, that's because it's not in an AFI, right? Look for AFPAM 341202. And that's the best place that you can go to get the order of events, all of the people involved for the change of command. Real quick, let's talk through what those order of events are. This is outlined fully in the pamphlet, but it starts with a opening narration. So you're going to want to have a narrator, right? Master of ceremonies of some sort and arrival fanfare. That's not always required, but, you know, important to have, especially like we were saying, moving up the echelons and the pomp and circumstances involved. Yeah. If you've got generals. Musical honors, if you've got a general honor. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Colors. So that doesn't mean crayons for all of our Marines that are listening to us. That means the flag, you know, the Star Spangled Banner, the national anthem should be played in honor of the flag. Sometimes there will be an invocation. The people participating in the ceremony, the commanders may invite a chaplain or some other important person to them to give an invocation. And then uh, the presiding officer, that colonel, that general officer will give some brief remarks. And for the outgoing commander, that may include some sort of award, you know, they may get a service medal of some kind to acknowledge the work that they did while in command. Following the presentation of that award, that outgoing commander will give some remarks as well. And then this is a new thing that it's starting to show up in instruction, but it's not fully like adopted into Air Force tradition, but I think it's going that way. And it's called a last salute. Reed, you want to explain what that is? Yeah, so actually in my very, very first unit, we had a wing commander change out and a formation of airmen that were a part of the unit, part of the wing, were present and we formed up just like in basic training or OTS where you, you know, march in and do facing movements and all the things that go along with drill and ceremony. And at a very specific time, like you highlighted, right at the end of the outgoing commander's remarks, they formally salute the outgoing commander as a way to render that symbol of recognition of rank and position as well as a sign of gratitude for everything that they have done. And it's not required. Yeah. It is required when, depending on rank, but that's all outlined in the pamphlet. But yeah, I've only done it and seen it done a few times, but it is a nice thing. I think it's nice. I like drill. I like ceremony. I think those things add meaning to these settings. And so, yeah. but yeah, it's pretty straightforward. You'll have usually an officer. I've seen it very often at the squadron level. It'll be the DO leading the formation and then a bunch of airmen of all ranks, right? You know, just everybody. And they will just, you know, 
squadron, present arms. Everybody salutes. The commander returns the salute. Then they drop the salute. It's very nice. And that's it. It's just a salute, but it means a lot, I think. I think yeah. it's a really nice, nice gesture. Yeah. So after the last salute, then, will be the actual change of command itself. You know, the whole reason that everybody is there to welcome in the incoming commander as presided over by the senior officer. And once that change of command has taken place, the incoming commander will give some remarks and there may be a first salute. Just as there was a last salute, there will now be a first salute formalizing that change of command. There may be some sort of closing remark by the MC. There is very typically going to be playing or singing the Air Force song. I have some thoughts on that, but I'll, <laughs> I'll save those for later. And then the official party, the senior presiding officer, the outgoing commander, and the incoming commander will depart the ceremony. And then there will likely be a reception of some sort afterward for everybody to meet the incoming commander, but not talk to or say thanks to or anything else for the outgoing commander. We'll talk a little bit more about why that is here in a moment. But all told, depending on how long the remarks go or by the presiding officer or the commanders involved, that's it. The ceremony doesn't really have to take all that much time. Maybe 20 minutes? Yeah, absolutely. It can be really fast. Yeah, it all depends on how loquacious the, you Good know, the commanders want to be. Oh, I, yeah, I brought that one out of my wallet. That was like a $5 word. But yeah, depending on how long they go, it really dictates this thing because the ceremony the actual change of command, which we'll talk about next, is actually pretty simple. So let's just get to it. Let's talk about what the actual change of command ceremony is. So I'm going to walk you through the, the actual ceremony. And basically, the three officers will, uh, you know, march kind of in front of the formation, if there is one, or just kind of in front of the audience. Uh, sometimes this is on a stage you know, or an auditorium. And so they will be in an elevated position or sometimes it's just in a room and they'll just kind of be in front. But essentially the presiding officer will lead this formation of three officers. It'll be the presiding officer, the outgoing commander, and then the incoming commander. That's the order. They'll do a facing movement, which is just fancy um, drill speak for they will turn and face the audience in a crisp military manner. And so there you go. There you have it. That's kind of like where they're the starting position, if you will. Uh, at this point, another person, usually the senior enlisted for the unit that the commanders are going to be you know, either the outgoing commanders leaving or the, the unit that we're all talking about, right? The senior <laughs> enlisted for that organization will approach these officers from behind and they will be carrying the unit's guidon. Uh, the guidon is a type of flag with a, a deep military history that is associated to a unit. Uh, it usually just has, you know, like the squadron or group or wings uh, name or number. It's usually pretty simple. Uh, blue for in the Air Force, they're blue in color with uh, like a gold writing. The way they look generally, just imagine a normal rectangular flag. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the short side of the rectangle that is opposite of the pole has a, a triangle cut out, yeah. kind of giving it like a forked tongue appearance, if you will. It's hard to explain on the radio. Just Google it. U.S. Air Force guide on. <laughs> You'll see what I'm talking about. Um, but they will hold that guide on. And that's kind of like a symbol of the unit. And you'll see how that plays a central role in the actual ceremony. Yeah. So once that enlisted airman is there with the guide on, the, the presiding officer will give a very low key command. You're not going to hear big command voice from the senior officer there, but he or she will signal to the other commanders to do a facing movement, to face toward the presiding officer. The outgoing commander will then salute the presiding officer and state that, sir, ma'am, I relinquish command. And this is the formal recognition that their command time has ended. The presiding officer will return the salute. The outgoing commander will then receive the guide on from the enlisted airman and present it to the presiding officer and then hand that back to the enlisted airman again. There may be a photo opportunity there to 
capture the end of that outgoing commander's time with the unit. But then that's it. Like the outgoing commander is done. Like that's their last action as the commander of that unit. Yeah. Those photo ops are always kind of funny to me. If you don't know what's going on, they look really odd. (laughs) Yeah. Like there's these two officers in their service dress, right? You know, their fancy uniforms and they're like holding a wooden pole, looking across, (laughs) like facing each other and looking at a camera. You're like, what is going on? Like, if you don't know what's happening, you know, and we'll get into the symbolism, but they are literally kind of saying, you know, this guide on which represents my unit, I am handing that unit back to the presiding officer and I'm giving it up. Like it's a very symbolic gesture. Yeah. And after this, you know, final act as a commander occurs, there's a essentially the incoming commander and the outgoing commander change places. You know, a few choreographed steps later, the outgoing commander is now at the back of the train and the incoming commander is standing right in front of the presiding officer. This incoming commander salutes, states, sir or ma'am, I assume command. Then the presiding officer takes the guide on from the enlisted member and then gives it to the incoming squadron commander, who then takes it in a symbolic gesture of receiving the organization. Yeah. And again, the hammy, stereotypical picture moment. (laughs) And then, you know, the new commander hands it back to the senior enlisted member. And then they'll again turn to face the audience. And that's it. Now, I know it took Colin, you and I, what, four or five minutes to describe (laughs) using (laughs) words. This whole thing happens in probably like 45 seconds to a minute. Right. Does not take much time. They rehearse this tip to any commander. Don't not rehearse this. It looks bad when you (laughs) can't like do a facing movement, but I've never seen that happen. It's always, it goes smoothly. It's quick. That's it. But there's so much symbolism and everything that goes into it that I think it's worth kind of talking about. Like, it's so simple, but there's a lot going on. Just as you were saying, this is a short ceremony, but it's very highly symbolic, long history, steeped in tradition. I think it's worthwhile to acknowledge where that tradition comes from. You know, it goes back all the way to the Roman Legion. One of the ways that a commander was signified, was recognized in that time is they had a staff, a baton of some sort with their standard on the top. And that's one way that legions and commanders were able to be differentiated. And so when it came time to change the commander of that unit, they would literally pass the baton. That's where the saying comes from. And so now... You know, fast forward to Prussia and the recodification of drill uh, by the Prussian army. They reinstated this tradition of the change of command, very formalized with pass and review, lots of drill and ceremony involved. And this was all in the 18th century. And that got adopted by the Americans. And it has persisted in our military since that time. And obviously, the Air Force coming from the army we get our tradition the way that we do changes of command from the army. Now we have adopted it for our own uses, but by and large, it's going to look very similar across the services, especially between the army and the air force. Now there are some other things that go along with the change of command that are not necessarily part of the ceremony itself, but there will often be some sort of reception after the ceremony, receiving line, meaning like here's the presiding officer and the new commander, probably with their families if they have one, and a big long line of people who want to come up and shake their hand, right? And it's a great way for that new commander to meet their unit for the first time. There may be a cake decorated to signify the moment, some other refreshments, Participants in the ceremony itself will likely be in service dress, and the formation that gives that last and that first salute are likely going to be in a blues uniform of some sort, maybe service, maybe short sleeve. But the rest of the party, everybody else that is there participating is probably just going to be in the normal uniform of the day, probably OCPs, right? Civilians are going to be in their normal business attire, but It may be something that people want to get gussied up a little bit, you know, clean up, get a haircut, you know, shave more than just once a day kind of thing. You want to look your best for this kind of ceremony because you can see from all of the tradition and everything that goes into it, the symbology that's involved. This is an important part of what we do in the military. Yeah, totally agree. 
Which is kind of funny because we just said all of these things about going a little bit above and beyond your average day to day. But if you've been in the military for any length of time and we let off with this, you're going to go to a ton of these things. They really yeah. kick off. Uh, June and July are when you are neck deep in change of command time. If you think about it, you've got squadron, group, and wing. And depending on how your organization is placed, where it is geographically, all that sort of stuff, combined with the fact that command tours are typically two years. Mm -hmm. So somebody at your organization or very near to you is going to be changing out every summer. So this summer for me, for example, my squadron commander and my wing commander are changing out within about, yeah, 20 days of each other. Multiple other group commanders are changing out. So my organization, we're a wing that's a tenant unit at Wright Pat. So we're not the wing for the base, but we are a wing that is held there. One wing commander, four groups, five really, but four primary, and 18 squadrons. And we're all in one big building. So there's, there's wow. a lot of changing <laughs> that's going on right now, right? So depending on your relationship with some of these other commanders, if you want to go to their change of command, or maybe you know an incoming commander to a different squadron or whatever, there are going to be a bunch of these happening. The only time I've ever missed a change of command with the unit I was associated with is when I was deployed. These are mandatory formations. Like, you're going to be there. Yeah. You're going to show up. So you're going to experience a lot of them, but I don't think that should take away from the significance, especially for those members who are participating in the change of command. It's a big deal for them. Yeah. And you mentioned that you missed a change of command, Ben, because you were deployed. But I want to note that changes of command do happen in the expeditionary environment as well. You know, you'll have commanders that are leading expeditionary units. Usually that's going to be a one-year assignment instead of two. And so if you can imagine how frequently those things happen and the kind of change that's involved there, you know, it, it just, it continues across the Air Force no matter where you are. And in some circumstances, the PCS cycle is such that a change of command like we've described in this episode, can't occur because the outgoing commander has to leave before the new commander can get there. And so in that type of circumstance, you're going to have an assumption of command instead of a change of command. There will still be a ceremony, very similar, but a little simpler in that there's no outgoing commander to participate. It's just the incoming commander. I've seen these happen a number of times in my career. So it does happen. You'll probably see it also for civilian organizations where there is no command structure, but there is a senior executive schedule or SES or government schedule or GS leader. You know, these SES or GS leaders are typically called a director and they are at the same level of a commander, but because they are civilian, they're not a commander, right? And so in that circumstance, there will be a change of leadership instead of a change of command. The ceremony is the same, except that there is no use of the word command. They use leadership instead, and obviously there will not be any salutes because, again, they're civilians. So this is all just to give you an idea of what the change of command looks like, try to emphasize the symbolism, the tradition of it all, and try to encourage to us and to you, our audience, to take these ceremonies seriously because they really are that important. Yeah. You know, and I think that's a good time to transition now to discuss kind of some things we've learned over the years, some hints, tips, and tricks, some things to keep in mind, and maybe a little bit of the understanding of some of these unspoken rules. We've hinted at a few, but it's a good time to get going. So I'll just kick it off with the stuff that we shouldn't even have to talk about, but we just will, right? This is the first time you're going to meet your new commander. This is your first impression that you're going to offer them. So don't screw it up. Yeah. So let me just say, though, you may know who the commander is. You may have worked with them before, but this is your first opportunity to meet them as your new commander. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Because the relationship is now different, right? It is. Shouldn't have to be said, but we're saying it because we like to be pedantic. Yeah. So let's do all the little things that you should be doing anyway. It's a great time to do it. Get a haircut. Make sure your uniform is on point. You know, if you've been having you know, those doubts in the back of your head, 
you know, thinking, oh, maybe I should get a new set. Yeah, if you need a new set of uniforms, just get it done. It's a great time to say, oh, you know, it's change of command season, want to look sharp kind of thing. It, yeah. It's a good time. I was in that place recently thinking, you know, I, these uniforms are kind of looking a little tired going on about three years. And I'm like, you know, change of command season, great time to go get a new set, knock it out. Yep. And there's a great new set of uniforms to be had, right? Yeah. You know, they just came out with the new summer weight. I mean, the Army's been using these for years, but, you know, let's start using them in the Air Force as well. Especially if you're in a hot environment, go get the new summer weight. They look great. They are. I can and They convert. feel great, right, Reed? Yep. 10 out of 10. Highly recommended. If you're involved in this ceremony in any sort of way, just crush it. Knock it out of the park. Don't just be lackadaisical about your approach to the ceremony because of what you just said. This is your first opportunity and only opportunity to make a first impression with the new commander. But not only that, your outgoing commander, he or she deserves the effort, right? Have this be a huge thank you to them. Have this be a huge welcome to the new commander. No amount of effort is going to be wasted in making this ceremony a success. Yeah, totally agree. And that leads to our next point, which it's kind of one and the same. Even though you're going to do a lot of these, they are very meaningful for the people participating in them. Do them a solid and do a good job. Make it special for them and those that are close to them. You mentioned, Colin, sometimes, you know, if the incoming or outgoing commanders have families, these are some of the only you know, real ceremonies that they get to participate in anymore because rank starts to kind of slow down at this point. You know, there's not a whole lot of promotions going on once you hit these echelons. And so these are kind of some of the last ceremonies that they get to participate in. So make it special. Just go that extra mile. We know airmen do that anyway, but we just, we had to say it. Yeah, it's worth saying. If you are a younger officer in, in the organization, you know, you're a new lieutenant, a young captain, you may have the chance to lead these ceremonies. And that could be the actual formation that we mentioned earlier, but more likely by lead, we mean actually organizing the thing. You get to be the project officer, the projo that is in charge of putting this ceremony together. So getting the invitations out, reserving facilities making sure that there is food there on time and it's of good quality. You might be the master of ceremonies, the narrator, whatever. Whatever your involvement is, if you are asked to lead or participate in the event, again, knock it out of the park. Just take it seriously. Put all the effort and time necessary to make it a success because, like we said, the commanders deserve it. There are few ways to give a commander the impression that you are not someone worth their time, that you are, we often like to use the term that you're a smash bag of donuts and you're not going to be useful to them in their time. That is not the impression that you want to leave. Take it seriously, do a good job, have it be that huge thank you and welcome to the commanders that are involved. Yeah, totally agree. This is not a time to not bring your A game. <laughs> it's the you know what if you're the pro Joe for a change of command. Not that there ever is a time for you to not bring your A game, right? Yeah. But you know, because it's so symbolic, because it's so important, this is the time to bring it. Yeah. So here's a little tidbit that I don't know many people really think about, but if they reflect back on their career, they will notice. But after the change of command, that outgoing commander is gone. Right. They are gone. There is no, oh, you know, there's something I was going to mention to him or her. I'll do that at the end of the ceremony. No. Like, as soon as they dismiss the official party, they are gone. Like, disappeared. You may not see them again ever. Yeah. If you do run into them again, it'll be years later in a completely different setting. This is all centered in around this very serious tradition that commanders have to reinforce the fact that the incoming commander, the new commander, is the commander. They are in command. There is no such thing as, hey, sir, I need you to sign this thing. No, they are gone. <laughs> yeah. As soon as this ceremony happens, anything that needed to get done by the outgoing commander has been transferred. Like, yep. that's it. So get all that stuff done well ahead of time. Honor this tradition and reinforce the new commander's position as the commander by just letting that commander go. They're gone. They're gone. Yeah, and because you know that the commander is going to be gone, 
And because you know that this is going to happen, you know that the change of command is coming. It's not like, it, oh, surprise, I guess we're going to do a, a change of command. Like, you know that this is happening. You know that it's a two-year window wherein you get these things done. Plan ahead. I say it's not that difficult. It is that difficult because, you know, commanders are very busy and things are very complex and dynamic and all that. I understand. But you know that it's coming. It's never a surprise. So make effort toward finishing the things that you can with the outgoing commander and also prepping for the new commander to come in. It should never be a surprise. Yeah, totally agree. So Colin, why don't you to introduce this next one, this idea of comparing old versus new. This is such a human thing, but we really need to talk about it. Yeah, so it is normal for us as humans to resist change and to experience organizational inertia that when a new commander comes in, we like the old way of doing things. But here's our invitation to you. Continue to operate just as you had been, but expect that you are going to be given new direction. And that's okay, right? The new commander is in place. They may have a vision. They will have a vision, I should say, of how things should go. Now, you can educate the incoming commander a little bit. You can give them some background, but don't resist the change if you see that it's not going to, you know, be a risk to life and limb unnecessarily, right? Sometimes those changes can be huge, immediate, and drastic, but most times those kinds of changes are going to be small and take a long time. And it is our responsibility to accept the new commander's vision and make it successful. That's what we do. We take the commander's vision, their intent, and we run with it. Not try to persist with the old commander because they are no longer commanding the unit. We need to support the incoming commander as best as we can. Now, one of the best ways to do that is to mentally prepare for it because like we said, this is not a surprise. Like, you know, this is coming. So don't be surprised when they ask you to do something differently. Don't gripe. If it's not legal, moral, ethical, if there's no unnecessary risk to life or limb, salute smartly, move out. Like that's what we're asking you to do. Yeah. This can be especially hard if you've really given yourself to a process or a function or a product right? Because we work hard. Yeah. We really put in the proverbial blood, sweat, and tears, sometimes literal blood, sweat, and tears into something because we wanted it to succeed. We felt it was a value. It was necessary for the mission. You name it. And then sometimes a new commander can come in and just kill it. Yeah, It's dead, gone, done. So it's understandable to be emotionally wrapped up in this thing that you've just given so much of your time to. Yeah, That's okay. What we're asking is to, like you said, prep because you know it's coming. And that leads me to kind of my, my last point is support your new commander. Mm -hmm. They have a lot to do. We've just spent a few months talking about all the things that we can think about that go into command, interviewing commanders, hearing their perspectives. They have a lot on their plate. From the second they hand that flag back to the presiding officer, they got a lot going on. Game on. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> and they've got a lot of decisions to make. They have to make critical decisions immediately. And you are going to forget how much background and context is now no longer present. Your previous commander had two years to sit in this stew and understand what it was to lead their organization. The new guy or gal, they don't have it. So be a little patient with them. You're going to make a statement. Hey, sir or ma'am, here's the situation. Here's what I recommend. And they're going to like ask basic yeah. basic questions like, wait a minute, what does that acronym mean? And you're going to have to take a step back. It's not because they're dumb. It's because they don't have the background and context that you have right. or that the outgoing commander did. So kind of like it ties to our previous point, you know, don't compare old versus new and be patient with these new commanders. They've got a lot that goes into what they're doing with significant impact. They want to do a good job, help them to do a good job by being a little patient and bringing them along. And with that goes this other idea that be very deliberate about baggage that you bring into a new command. Mm -hmm. What am I saying there? I'm saying that sometimes 
if a member or a situation needs a new set of eyes, maybe it's not exactly the best idea to bring in all the, well, he said, she said background of, you know, political infighting or personal personnel conflicts or whatever led to this conflict or situation. Maybe they just need a fresh start. Allow them that space. Yeah. Don't poison the well, as we say. You know, oh, this airman's a dirtbag. So the second your commander gets in the seat, they believe that this airman's a dirtbag. Right. You have to make a judgment call about how to do that. Sometimes you do need to do that. This airman is under investigation. Here is the facts as we have them. That kind of thing, right? You can't let that happen. But at the same time, maybe an airman that had been struggling is starting to turn the corner. And what they need is that fresh set of eyes, that second chance. I'm asking you as an officer to make a judgment call about what to bring when it comes to the commander with respect to all of the background and context. I don't have answers here. This is tough. Yeah, and you use the example of a dirtbag airman, but it could be a program that you disagree with or a policy that you disagree with, or it could be maybe not even disagreement, something that you really like and you really think that should happen and you maybe not poison the well, but you want to flavor it a little bit, yeah, you know, to try and achieve your own agenda. But maybe that's not the best thing for the unit. The point is use judgment. Think about what is best for the Air Force, for the accomplishment of the mission. What is best for the people that are involved? Not necessarily try to make things. You don't want to put rose colored glasses on. Thank you. Like if things are not good, call the baby ugly. Yeah. But at the same time, don't completely make everything sound awful, miserable, no good, very bad. Because something that comes with a change of command is change. And sometimes that change is necessary. Yeah. It's in the word. <laughs> yeah, it really is. And so, you know, we've talked about a ton of things today, Colin. And I think, you know, if we were to put on the Reddit, too long, didn't read, change of command going to happen all the time. There are things you can do to influence the situation to be a success for you and a success for your organization. Yeah. And if that's not our job as officers is to think about the success of our organizations, I mean, that's kind of what we're here for, right? So yeah. hopefully some of these things that we've talked about can kind of help you turn the corner and get prepared because gear up. We're in the middle of it, right? Like it's change of command season. So let's bring it. Yeah. And it's going to happen again next year. Yep, exactly. <laughs> so so get ready. All right. Well, this has been good, Reed. I appreciate the discussion back and forth, the tips and tricks that we've highlighted here. If any of you have additional tips and tricks, we would love to hear them. If you have other comments or questions, concerns about changes of command, please reach out to us. I think that'll be it for this one, though. What do you think? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for joining us for this week's episode of Commission Ed. Commission Ed.